Last video, I introduced integration by parts. I did some examples that showed the direct use of the technique. In this video, I have three more examples for you. These examples show of some of the more creative uses of the integration by parts. It turns out to be a pretty powerful and flexible technique with a number of use cases that are not immediately obvious. So it's nice to show you some of these clever examples. The first one is a strange one. Integration by parts is used for products. There has to be a DFDX and a G in the setup. Well, how can it be used when there isn't any product at all? Well, there is a clever trick I can use to create a product. Here I have the logarithm. Since multiplication by one doesn't do anything, I can write this integrand as one times the logarithm. Well, then I have a product. And with a product, I can now apply integration by parts. I choose df dx to be one and g to be ln x. This choice is nice because the derivative of g will get rid of the logarithm. Then I calculate the other two pieces. The antiderivative of one is x and the derivative of the logarithm is one over x. Well, now I have all the pieces and I can write the right side of integration by parts. x times ln x minus the integral of x over x, which is just the integral of one. And the integral of one is just x. So the result is x ln x minus x plus the constant of integration. And you might say now, well, we already knew this. This was on the table of integrals. And that's true. But why did we know this? How did it end up on the table of integrals? Everything on the table of integrals was at some point calculated and proved. And this shows how I actually know that the antiderivative of the logarithm, integration by parts, calculates it. Here's a more general example. Sometimes I'd like to be able to talk about whole classes of integrals, and products of exponentials and trig are pretty common functions, so I want to know how to integrate those products. This is going to be another creative and indirect use of integration by parts, so let me set it up. In this, a and b are some real number constants. So I have a product, and I choose to set df dx as e to the ax, and g as sine bx. The antiderivative of e to the ax is e to the ax over a, which is a substitution rule integral if you want to do it. And the derivative of sine bx is b times cos bx, which is a chain rule calculation. Then I apply integration by parts. The first term fg is e to the ax times sine bx over a, and the integral is b over a times e to the ax cos bx. All right, so I did integra integration by parts. And I essentially exchange the sine in the integral for a cosine. The b over a is a constant, which I pulled out of the integral. Was that any good? Well, I'm not sure. I can do integration by parts again, choosing df dx to be e to the ax again, and g to be cosine of bx. And again, the antiderivative of e to the x is e to the ax over a, and the derivative of cos bx is negative b sine bx. So I do integration by parts again. The first term is unchanged. I'm only changing the integral. The b over a stays out in front. The fg term in integration by parts is e to the ax cos bx over a. And the, res the resulting integral is b over a e to the x times negative sine bx. Well, then I can pull out negative b over a from the last integral and distribute negative b over a over the two terms in the brackets. And do be very careful with the negatives. There are actually three negatives on the last term. One from before the bracket, one as written, and one pulled out of the negative sign in the integral. This is the result of all that work, and it looks sort of depressing. I'm right back to where I started from. I get exactly the same integral back out of doing integration by parts twice. So what have I done? Well, after thinking about this for a moment, it's actually much better than it looks. I want to solve for this integral. It appears twice in the equation, but I can solve for it. This is an equation, an equation of functions, but it's an equation and I can do algebra. I'll add the last term for both sides of the equation so that essentially moves the term to the left and makes it positive. So this is the result of moving that term. Well, then I can factor the integral out of the left side. The first part is just one times the integral, and the second part is b squared over a squared times the integral. 
So the other factor is 1 plus b squared over a squared. And I'll also go to common denominator on the right. Well, then I'll divide by 1 plus b squared over a squared. I then have to simplify the nested fraction on the right, but this is actually pretty good since the a terms just cancel, leaving a squared plus b squared in the denominator. And the result is an expression for the integral. All I have to do is add the constant of integration, and it's finished. And this is pretty neat, I think. I did integration by parts twice, which just brought me back to the original integral, but then I could solve for that integral, which, after all the algebra, actually gives me an antiderivative. This is the antiderivative of a product of an exponential and a sine function. Finally, here is one more example. This example shows that sometimes multiple integration techniques have to be put together to solve an integral. I want to integrate sine of the square root of x from 0 to pi squared over 4. This doesn't look very promising at the start. There's not much to work with. However, I'm going to do substitution for root x and see what happens. If u equals root x, then du is 1 over 2 root x, that's the derivative of root x, times dx. To make this more reasonable, I can replace root x with u, that is a substitution after all, and then isolate dx by multiplying both sides by 2u. And the result is that 2u du equals dx. I also need the new bounds. If x is 0, then u is also 0, since root, of root 0 is 0. And if x is pi squared over 4, then u is the square root of that, which is just pi over 2. Now I can change everything in the integral. 0 becomes 0, pi squared over 4 becomes pi over 2, sine root x becomes sine u, and dx becomes 2u du. And I'll write the du in front of the sine, as is usual notation. All right, the substitution did get rid of the square root, but it introduced a u in front of the sine. Well, that's fine, since this is now a good setup for integration by parts. I set df dx as sine u, and g as 2u, so that f is negative cos u and dg dx is 2. Then I apply the right side of integration by parts. The fg part is 2u times negative cosine u, evaluated on the bounds. And the integral is now the integral of 2 times negative cosine u. I do the evaluation on the bounds, and I pull negative 2 out of the integral. Both of these two terms are 0. Cos of pi over 2 is 0, and the second is simply multiplied by 0, so only the integral is left out of these terms. The antiderivative of cos is sine, and evaluated from pi over 2 to 0 is just 1, and then multiplied by 2 gives a final answer of 2. The original area under the original curve, found by a combination of doing substitution that creates an integral and integration by parts, is in fact 2.